Welcome to Intuitive Connections, where spirituality and psychology meet to help you be your best and brightest self. I'm your host, Victoria Shaw, and in each episode, I'll help you to awaken your own inner wisdom, step into your power, and live a more divinely inspired life. You're here to let your inner light shine. Are you ready? Let's do this. Hello and welcome to Intuitive Connection. Today we have a guest that I'm really excited about. And I'm excited for a couple of reasons. I'm excited, first of all, because she combines two of my favorite modalities, Akashic Records and Astrology. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But also because she was someone who was recommended by you, my listeners, the listeners to this show over in the Facebook group. I think a couple of people, Melanie, had um, said that they had done sessions with you and were talking about it in the group. And I was like, should we have her on the show? And it was a big, loud yes So it just makes me so happy to have that because when you do a podcast, it's sort of, you know, sometimes feels like you're talking to air, you know, (laughs) and and you sometimes forget that there are people on the other side of the microphone that are like actually listening to what you're saying. So anyway, the feedback, it's so beloved and I'm so excited to connect with you. I'm going to read her little intro because it's so sweet. And then we'll we'll launch into this. So Melanie is an Akashic Records reader and astrologer uh, that utilizes the two to provide divine design readings and offering that helps clients uncover their unique soul level blueprint for creating a life that feels like a love letter to all of who they are. That's the part I wanted to read. <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of life we all need, right? One that feels like a love letter to our beautiful selves. So Melanie, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yay. All right. So we pre-chatted a little bit about astrology before we we got on this. And I don't know if listeners know, but I've had a long time love affair with astrology. My first coach and my first sort of one of my big pivotal moments in my own journey, and I think I talk about this in in the Kathy Rose episode too, was an astrology reading I had where she basically told me all of my hopes and dreams and all the things that I'd imagined, you know, my life to be when I was a child. And she was like, oh yeah, this is your chart. This is your fate. And it opened up everything for me. It changed everything. It was a huge shift. And um, since then, you know, I'm just continually in awe of astrology, even though I don't have the mathematical mind for it. Like not at all. And then Akashic Records is something else that I'm really interested in. And we've had a couple of readers on the show and we've had one that did use the term divine design. So oh, that's interesting. yeah, so I don't know if maybe you all have similar training. Mm. She's another young and like you. So it's possible <laughs> and soul blueprint. So the same verbiage. But, you know, for me, I've never been trained in Akashic Records. But when I was first starting out and working with my primary guide, one day he's like, hey, I want to take you somewhere. And yeah, it was like down this tunnel, right? And I'm just checking if I want to share this. And they say, go ahead. So I'm going to share. (laughs) And I remember I'm like, I don't know if I want to go down that tunnel. And he's like, okay, when you're ready, we'll go down Mm -hmm. the tunnel. And it, it kept coming up and it kept coming up. And so, okay, you know, and I was with my coach, so I felt a little safe. And I'm like, all right, let's do it. And, you know, I went down the tunnel with him and I got to this place and it was space. I was like, Mm -hmm. it's just space. Like, I don't know what this is, but it's this incredible spaciousness. And it felt magnificent. And my Mm -hmm. coach at the time said, oh, that's the Akashic Records. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that's kind of what I think. I think of the Akashic Records. And of course, you're the guest. So I really, (laughs) really want to hear it from you. But I think of the Akashic Records, it's the space of potentiality. It's the space Mm -hmm. of everything that could happen, that has happened that will happen all bundled into one beautiful piece. And it's just, it's just our spaciousness, our potential. Mm -hmm. So that's how I experience it, um, which is I know different than what a lot of readers do, but I do believe that, you know, we tap into that in my work and I think it's beautiful. So anyway, all right, that is a long (laughs) preamble. Melanie, welcome. Tell us your story. Sure. So I think I've always been an energetically sensitive person, but didn't quite understand that they were psychic gifts when I was younger. I definitely had a gift of claircognizance just being in school. I could raise my hand and not know what the answer is, but just speak and I would just know, like just that clear knowing would come through um, and clear audience, not knowing an answer, but I'll hear the answer and just a very strong sense 
of attunement. I think something within me can just hear what people are hungry for. And I think it especially serves me in caring for children. Like I'm able to have a very strong energetic attunement to really nurture in that way. But I feel like coming into my gifts most fully didn't quite happen until undergrad. I feel like I had a spiritual birth and it was such a beautiful experience. I had turned to yoga and meditation. It's funny, my intent wasn't to develop a spiritual development. It was literally just stress relief. I was feeling so overwhelmed as a student right. and I discovered so much more. I really felt like I had stumbled upon just a state of consciousness that I'd never experienced before. It felt like I reached this place where it literally felt like I was walking the ocean floor. And it was just this sense of like expanded spaciousness, no matter what was going on in my life. It just felt like this extended stillness. And then within that place, I would hear guidance about how to navigate my life, whether it's like this internship opportunity sounds great, but don't take it. It's not aligned with what you need right now. And it was just crazy. Like, I didn't know that that could happen. <laughs> um, and so I was just being uh -huh. guided in this way. And it really just kicked off my own psychic exploration. So then I started more intentionally picking up psychic tools, uh, whether it was tarot, astrology, Akashic records, just across the board. But I feel like the ones that feel the most home to me have always been astrology and Akashic record readings. Beautiful. Well, it sounds like you were tapping into those things anyway, and that the teaching was maybe just a way of, you know, finding someone else's words to explain to you what you were doing. Mm, yes, exactly beautifulness. Oh my gosh, I have so many questions <laughs> and so much to say. Well, I always have so much to say. Let's talk Akashic Records first. We both have been to the spaciousness, which is so cool. <laughs> I'm in awe of you and so many of my friends, my colleagues, my clients who have had these experiences in their 20s because... <laughs> And and I like to think it's just has to do with like planetary shifts and stuff. But some of us late bloomers that, you know, were well in, you know, on our way to middle age when we woke up, it just blows my mind and excites me to see your generation really grasping this stuff and, and saving yourself 20 years of muddling <laughs> around with the blindfold on like I was doing. So I, I just think it's so magnificent. Uh, but talk to me about the Akashic Records. Like, what does that, what does that mean to you? And, and how, how does a reading work? And it sounds to me like you were already kind of going there and doing that, you know, before you, you studied it, right? Mm -hmm. I definitely think so in ways that I wasn't quite aware and probably most strongly in my dreams, uh, which is funny that in my waking life, which is where I do the Akashic record work, it's more, I reach a meditative state and then I'm intentionally asking, but dreams feel like if the intentionally asking is the active, I feel like my dreams are a receptive space where sometimes I get a heightened dream. Like I've been recording my dreams since undergrad. So I think that's about seven years now. And I can definitely see the ways that I am channeling quite similarly to how I would when I'm meditating, but in a dream state. Um, but for me, Akashic Record readings, I literally see it when I'm tapping in. It's almost like an energetic library, but it's sitting on a cloud and I enter it. And then for some reason, one of my guides is Anubis. And so he's the one who helps me interface with the record. And it's just crazy to watch even my own relationship with the Akashic Records has evolved that there is actually a difference between my personal relationship with the records as opposed to when I give readings. So when I'm giving readings, I stay in that library. But within when I'm working in service of myself, I actually see almost like a psychic house. Like they take me somewhere and each house has rooms at different levels of my consciousness. And it's been really cool to explore that house. Wow. But I think it relates to the fact that every record that I open has such a strong distinct individual energetic vibration that in opening each one is almost like, I mean, in and of itself, it is a different record, but it literally feels like being in a different place. Like some people's records will take me, they'll literally say like, you need to go to the ice rink. And so I'll hold the record and I'll sit on the ice rink and then they'll tell me more about that person's sporty essence. But it's like, literally there's something locational about it for me that everyone's record feels different, but also has its own location, which is interesting. That is really interesting. And it sounds like you're super visual and super kinesthetic in the way that you experience it. 
Mm -hmm. Which is hilarious because my 3D eyes, I'm not visual (laughs) in a clairvoyant way when I'm doing this work. It's like my mind's eye, I think, is actually stronger than my 3D eyes. I love that you said that because my mind's eye is my least developed sense. (laughs) <laughs> so I'm a clear cognizant. I'm a hearer. I'm a feeler. I get visuals now. It was mm-hmm. the last one to develop. And I it's not normally where I go. I just know and I just hear things. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the real world, I'm a total visual learner. Oh, and I'm a very goodness. visual person. I've <laughs> thought about that a lot. It's like, I think if, you're, if your 3D self, you know, has one sense really, really developed, Mm -hmm. then, you know, that one may be less available for your intuitive senses. I don't know. Um, Because I have auditory processing issues. Like Mm -hmm. I grew up with learning disabilities. Like all of that stuff is kind of funky. And But when I'm in my intuition, my brain works just fine. (laughs) But visually, I'm pretty adept. Yeah. We are polar opposites in that way. Yeah. And I, I, so I think that's super interesting. And I wonder listeners, if you guys have those experiences where you might notice that in the 3D, you have a a sense that's really strong. And then in the intuitive dimensions differently. And again, no rules here because we're all different, but I find that fascinating. So you're very visually oriented. Yeah. Interesting in that, like you were saying before about feeling like a late bloomer, I feel like I was in terms of spiritual development as a whole, recognizing this inner vision actually came quite late, like in like the psychic sense of hearing and the clairsentience, I felt very actively aware that that was a thing. But for me, it wasn't until really picking up the Akashic record that I feel like it was like my vision turned on. So I wonder if there's also a relationship with like finding your tool that like also helps unlock something because I remember even doing an astrology reading for someone. And sometimes I also just have this, like, I call it a copycat gift where in doing a reading for someone, sometimes I can take on what their gifts are. And I know it's not me because I'm like, I'm not configured. to <laughs> I see aura. Sometimes someone will come in. I'll be like, I see your aura. Do you see auras? Because I don't see auras, exactly. right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. I know exactly what you mean. I did a reading for someone who was a visual artist, which once again, is not my skill set in the least. I have trouble drawing stick figures. <laughs> Um, But I was doing his chart and literally it was like the chart became 3D and started moving. And it was literally like the chart within itself kept all of its integrity as it moved. And I know within my own brain, like I see things like almost like a movie screen. Like you can know that the objects on the screen have 3D dimensions, but you can't see it. It's more implied this man's brain it was literally like a 3d computer like i could move the objects and everything was 3d and i was like whoa like my mind's not like that so i asked him like do you perceive the world that way and he's like yeah i thought everyone did it's like yeah. no <laughs> yeah i think that's fascinating i love that you bring that up because i know for me like i for years i worked with this one doctor alternative doctor in when I was in Connecticut and she would send a lot of patients to me. Mm-hmm. And what the real gift was, because I am i don't call myself a medical intuitive. Do I sometimes get information of that ilk? Yeah, I do. I don't, but I don't have any medical background. So I don't, I don't like to put out that expectation, but she would love to send clients to me with medical questions because if she would ask me questions about a, a patient, I would get all sorts of answers for her. And literally I was just intuitively picking her brain, right? Mm-hmm. I was seeing what she knew and I'd, you know, and so what I learned to do with her, she'd send me the clients and then, you know, I would get back on the phone with her and I'd be like, all right, now that I met the client, <laughs> let me tell you, there's a little pink powder and I don't know what it is, but it does this and it, you know, and but again, it, I think, you know, a lot of times too, we do have that gift to get into other people's brains and, you know, and then, then I think, and the guides are, are prompting me to say that when we do that too, we, we deepen their gifts as well, mm-hmm. right? Because now, not only does he know consciously, oh, this is a thing, there's something about your little energy melding, meddling that, you know, was very, for that person in particular, was very helpful for them. Wow, that's amazing that you say that because with that person in particular, it made me wonder about if people can be psychic amplifiers for each other because it was like things of mine even felt like they were heightened in relationship with this person. So it's really fascinating that you say that. And it's also funny 
as a kid, there are things that I used to long to experience that like and realizing now in retrospect actually are psychic gifts that I'm able to do now, which is really funny. As a kid, I used to always say that I wish I could USB my mental experience and hand it to someone. But now it's like I can receive that like in doing this work that I can process how they process. And then when it's done, it's like, okay, I'm back in my own skin. But it's like funny that I used to long to be able to have that experience and now it's here. And I'm like, wow. (laughs) Okay. First of all, I want to pause because, you know, I've worked with a lot of children. I've been a child. I've had children. That that is not a common longing. (laughs) So that tells me something very specific about you and how you're already tapping into your life's work and your life plan as a child. Because again, those are not, those are not typical experiences. A child sits down, you know, in kindergarten and says, I wish I could USB my, (laughs) that's just absolutely adorable. So you are already tuning into and hearing your life's calling and setting that up for yourself. Mm, Yeah. So sweet that you say that. I think in reflecting my own sense of calling and purpose was really apparent in ways that actually don't make sense, even as a munchkin. Like I can remember having recurring nightmares about like this man breaking into my house and he's holding a gun and like threatening me. And I would literally say as a kid, and I was probably as young as like six and it would repeat through the years that like I don't want to go yet because my work's not finished like I knew I was here to do something even before I might have understood what that something is but I was very clear like I don't want to go before I've accomplished what I was sent here to do oh that's beautiful well I'm I'm glad that that dream was (laughs) was not precognitive yeah (laughs) beautifulness all right back to the Akashic records what are they to you Like, how do you understand them? Because I know listeners, most of my, we're always preaching to the choir here, and I'm sure many of you listening have heard of the Akashic Records, but maybe some haven't. And certainly none of them, except for the few listeners that have already done readings with you, have, you know, heard about your take. So let's talk. What does that mean to you? What are the Akashic Records? Sure. So to me, they are an energetic library that records the past, present, and future possibilities of a soul. So in opening a record my experience of it as a reader. In my early explorations of the record and in trainings, a lot of Akashic record readings can be very past life oriented. And I do understand the significance of that. The past does inform the present in a million different ways. Um, But in my own work with the records, I actually, unless I'm prompted and I frequently am in specific parts of a reading, I'm actually a lot more present focused on this lifetime just because I feel that as you're navigating the difficulties of this lifetime, sometimes it helps to just focus a little. And in doing so, and in adding in astrology to the Akashic Record readings, when I open a record and I'm guided by the birth chart, almost like um, like an energetic treasure map, and I can follow where to look. This like sacred imagery arises that kind of speaks particularly, and this is getting a little bit technical, um, but in birth charts and astrology, there are aspect patterns, which is basically how multiple planets are in relationship with each other. To me, the records itself taught me that those relationships carry this like image. And within that image, it's like a blueprint for how to create the results that you were willed, whether it's by God, by divine, by the universe to create in your life. And it's like a step-by-step instruction. Um, And so in bringing that imagery to life, I like hear it or I see it or I feel it and then I write it down. But yeah, it comes with a lot of, sometimes music comes through. Sometimes it's just like, I'll hear the image. Sometimes even biblical stories come through. It's really an amalgamation of probably my own personal religious exploration and music taste, (laughs) but (laughs) whatever is helpful or aligns with what needs to be conveyed. But yeah, I think that's my relationship with the records. They're an energetic library that captures the past, present, and potential futures, but a lot of my work is very present focused. Yeah, you said a lot. You said a lot, and I don't even know where to start. (laughs) I love the present focus because I'm someone too who's gotten past life information from my clients pretty much since I started. I remember Mm -hmm. the very first time I was giving readings for free for friends, like just getting my practice up and running. 
And all of a sudden I see someone in a place that I know that they were not, you know, I'm like, this is not Brooklyn. Wait, why do I see her there? You know? And, and she recognized it was, I was lucky because she recognized the place right away. And is a place that she had been in this body felt a resonance with. Yeah. So it was very validating that way. And, you know, the past life was also very relevant to the present, which is, I think the deal like, but I almost always, I occasionally do past life readings because people really like them, but Mm -hmm mostly I wait until they come. I wait until they come because I feel like, just like you said, we're we're here to be in the now. And that's where we're supposed to focus our energy and attention. That's where all the good stuff happens. And sometimes when there's a past life overlay or there's some other energy, like it helps to point us back to what we're doing in the now when we understand, mm-hmm. you know, what's happening in that other body or that from that other perspective, it, it can help us reshift to the now. So we're not getting lost in that, or we're being directed of, okay, in that body, you did this in this body, you know, maybe you want to try going the other way. Mm-hmm. Right. So they're, they're pointers back, you know, to that, what's our purpose and mission now. Mm-hmm. But I think sometimes people get lost and I have to fix all those past lifetimes, you know, the way we're like, I have to fix all my past trauma. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I feel like that energy, it can be helpful to a point, but I think it's also limiting. Mm, Very much so. And I also think the intention in which you approach the Akashic Records really matters. And for me personally, both in my experience reading for others, but also personally reading for myself, that it's deeper than curiosity, that it's not just a matter of like, oh, I wonder who I was last lifetime. Like, for me, it really needs to be a service. And it hasn't been something that feels helpful, like you were saying, unless it comes to me as like, oh, this past life theme is really presenting itself in this current lifetime in this way, then I typically don't end up spending lots and lots of time there. So it's really a question of if you are in a process of wanting to create a life that feels aligned in this lifetime, like what's the most useful way that we could do that? Yeah. No, I love that. I and mean, I I used to practice like you. Now I will. I will occasionally do past life readings. People love them. And I think, you know, whenever we set the intention for the highest good, mm. exactly what comes through, you know, the people that show up for that, the life that comes through, the whatever it is, it always aligns. <laughs> it always aligns. But I also think it's important not to set up expectations mm. that are going to take us away from, you know, where we can get the most bang for our buck in terms of the work that we do. Yeah. And so overall, I agree with you a thousand percent. We want to focus in the now. And when a past life or, you know, alternate life comes up or whatever you want to call them, because I don't believe there's time. So it's it's all happening in the now. That's what I'm showing again and again and again. And, and as you shift from one perspective, you're actually shifting the past and the future. Mm-hmm. And they're in a constant dynamic motion. So, you know, the way we understand it is is somewhat flawed anyway, but mm-hmm. you know, it's just how the linear mind works. But anyhow, I, I think that, you know, focusing on the now is the point. So I, I love how you say that. So someone comes to you for a reading and uh, I was telling Melanie before that I really wish I had given her my information ahead so I could have <laughs> I could have got a freebie on here for you all to listen to. That's why I was doing it. It was for you. It wasn't for me. Um, but okay, somebody comes to you, right? And they give you their birth date and, you know, the Akashic records. I mean, what what does that look like? What typically comes through? And I'm guessing you're like me and it, it could be anything, but give me some fun examples. <laughs> It definitely could be anything. Um, So I start off with the astrology of it all before I delve into the record. So I'll receive the birth information and then make the chart. Um, And then looking at the chart from my very ordinary state of consciousness, I like write down some of the things that stand out to me and then particularly note what the aspect patterns are. And then in opening their record, or even before opening it, just looking at the record, people's records can look so different. (laughs) Like I did a reading for one person where literally on the surface, her record was the cutest thing I've ever seen. It was this like pink, fluffy, really small journal. Then I opened it and there was a bomb inside. Like she had such potent energy, but her surface presentation was very sweet. And it was so cool to watch that interplay. Some people's chart literally like 
it was almost like it was hand woven, like there was something that was really loving about it. And then in opening the record, I heard that like the biblical story of Joseph, that like that weaving almost felt like a gift the same way that Joseph got like the robe from his father. And it was a represent of being loved and adored. Like that same felt sense of love was just so present and how that love also has a dark side, like the biblical story of Joseph, that love created so much jealousy and betrayal in their family. And that person also had a similar experience of other people being very jealous of their light and what that has meant for their life and the fear that can come with shining brightly with all of who you are, but there are consequences to that um, and having to learn how to shine your light and trust that the process or the initiation that betrayal can take you through that it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you turn your light down. I think you learn how to hold your light and hold what comes with it as well. Um, So it's interesting that even the surface appearance of people's record also has a message for me. And yeah, in opening it, it's always just like fascinating. (laughs) I never know what I'm going to get, but I definitely get very strong, just sacred imagery. Like even the bomb, it took me step by step of like bombs are designed within the bomb to have a very clear intent for how it's going to be set off. And it's like for that person in particular, setting the intention of what they want to use their power for or their magic for is such an important first step. And then there's a process for them of finding the matches and lighting the fuse. And that also had a specific message of like, being able to take that match back from someone who was trying to take it from her. Um, so re-empowering herself and then lighting the bomb and literally the power that it cascaded. It was like she had this manifesting ability right. that literally, like the same way if an alien were to come to this planet and see a bomb, you would think that it's not very powerful because it's small, but like the power that she is able to create even in small steps, it's potent. So it's really cool that the imagery itself is almost like a guidebook of instruction. And it kind of walks me through step by step how people can create really great results in their life. I love it. I love it. And, you know, for me with imagery, like I said, it was the last one to come. And now it's one of my favorites because, you know, I get I'm a word girl, right? (laughs) I get everything. and, And I think that's a gift. And I'm really happy to have it. But when you get an image, it conveys so much more. It conveys so much more. It gets us out of that left brain linearness, right? It's true that I think an image is worth a million words. Mm-hmm. So I, I love that so much. And I also think that one of the things that you're doing, and I think you're going to resonate with this when I say it, when you are tuning into someone's record, you're tuning into the energy of their soul, of this mm-hmm. incarnation. And that's what we all long for. That is, to me, the deepest healing. When somebody feels into the real you with you, you know, that's that's where the awakening process starts, Mm -hmm. right? It's not even about the information. It's just about, oh, my God, when we are felt, seen, and honored on that level, it's just like, it's delightful. Mm -hmm. It really is a process of attunement and being able to mirror back to people just the richness of who they are. It really is a gift and a privilege. Yeah, I agree. And you feel into it too. I think when I'm tuning into what you do, and you'll tell me if this jibes with your experience, you know, when you tune into people on the soul level, you can't help but love them in such a deep and awe inspiring way because you see, you know, the magic, you know, that created this 3D persona. Like you see the real magic of who they are. And it is just, it's amazing, right? Absolutely amazing. I fall deeply in love with all of my clients because it's just you're in awe. What their soul is able to do is absolutely amazing. And it's also funny in doing a reading or being able to cultivate these skills. It took time, but in doing the reading, it puts me right back in the role of the student and that their soul teaches me so much as I'm doing the readings. So it's really cool. It's like getting to sit in on lectures from this person's soul and they teach you so much. Yes. Oh, I love that. And I always say, you know, we teach what we need to learn again and again and again and again and again. And, you know, I've I've been very forthcoming on this podcast. There are times when I sit down 
I mean, I always learn from everything <laughs> and, right? and I'm, you know, <laughs> life, life is my teacher as it's supposed to be. But there are times when I sit down to record a solo episode on this podcast because, you know, that's when my guides get my attention. <laughs> And so that's what I'm like, oh, that's what you've been trying to tell me right. every day. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times too, when I'm doing a reading for a client or, or coaching or one of the many things that I do, that's all just variations on the same thing anyway. A lot of times too, like, you know, I'll notice who comes into my office. What are their concerns? Because a lot of times there's a message in it for me too. And my favorite thing, and that's what you're talking about, is where, you know, you really are a student in school and they're getting information and you're like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I got to write this down. (laughs) Like, I didn't know that before. And their soul is teaching you. And those Mm -hmm. are just such powerful moments. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. And I don't think it was something that I realized would happen before starting to do this work, but once you do it, (laughs) you definitely realize that. They are teaching you just as much, if not more, as you go. Yeah, absolutely. And it's always a two-way street, right? Because we're all connected. So we are all mm-hmm. we are all dancing together. And I think the more aligned we are, you know, the more graceful that dance can be. Mm-hmm. But it's we're always dancing. <laughs> we're always <laughs> dancing. And so it's always, you know, teachers learning, student is is teaching. Like I think that's just how it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Exactly. All right. So I want to come back to the statement of creating a life that feels like a love letter to all who you are, who you really are. What does that feel like? What does that mean? Yeah, I think in my, and I'll focus on myself for now and how this work has really served me is that I feel like moving through life We receive a lot of scripts about what a successful life looks like, Um, like what you should do, what you should be earning, what you should value. And I felt like in my life, I had followed that path to a degree and didn't find it very fulfilling (laughs) Um, and realized that my own inner wiring just wasn't built for those things. And sometimes it just made me feel like I was navigating life without a map because I'm like, so like I'm supposed to do X, Y, Z to be successful, but I'm not finding a richness there on a spiritual sense. And I feel like this work, even tapping into my own imagery, sometimes receiving the image has just made me cry because right. <laughs> it just moved me so deeply. Like for one of them, I received an image of It actually came to me as seeing a volcano and a helicopter orbiting around it. Then I was told, like, look up this career. And then I looked it up because I actually didn't know it existed, a volcanologist. And I was like, (laughs) oh. (laughs) And so then the more I started learning about volcanoes and then also realizing that volcanoes have been a recurring theme in my dreams and realizing the points in my life where that has happened Like, it was just magical. And listening to volcanologists talk about their relationship with volcanoes, it literally was just sobbing. But there was just something really, really beautiful about thinking about my own relationship with place, that there are places on this earth, like volcanoes can't just erupt anywhere or be anywhere. There are specific hot spots or places where the tectonic plates come together just right. Like, the conditions have to be right for a volcano to even be possible. But then for me on a psychic level, it's almost like God acts on the plate and it turns what was solid since the core of the earth isn't molten, it's actually solid, but like God acts on it and makes what was solid liquid. And then that magma has to like go through this process of rising through the earth and it erupts and it looks so disruptive and chaotic. But like, there's actually a process where when the magma becomes lava, if it dries too quickly or solidifies too quickly, you actually get glass. Like the inner atoms aren't aligned in a way to be strong enough to hold. Like it actually takes time for the correct formation to come to life and be solid earth that you can stand on. And that as a process in my life brings so true. (laughs) There are so many transitions in my life that have been volcanic in nature. And I always would say, I feel like I'm not having solid ground to stand on and especially as a Taurusy sun like I want solid ground yeah but I feel like my whole chart has this 
volcanic energy to it where like it's liquid for a reason and that there's new earth that's literally being birthed in you even if it doesn't feel like it and it can take a couple years to find that solid ground again and actually taking a sense of pride in that that like I'm not after glass like I don't want something that's going to shatter and regardless of my own cries for I'd like this period of testing to end there's a new life that's being birthed and I just never felt that scene in my process, because in looking at it from the outside, I'm sure it could look like, oh, well, she's like been in transition for a long time. But it's like I'm in my own process. And I just had never seen like the earth speak to me in such a deep way. Like so many people merge spirituality and psychology. But for me, what's emerging is like geology and spirituality. And something really beautiful just happened for me. And realizing that as my own soul imagery, it literally just made me cry. Like it rung so true. That's beautiful. That's so beautiful. And I think too, it speaks to the way that our guides often speak to us, where you're going to ask one question and you're going to get so much more, (laughs) right? You're going to get so much more. And we have this linear way of, okay, well, what do I do next? What's the tool? What's the this? What's the that? And that's a very human way to do it. And if you need to do it that way, you keep doing it. It's all good. But I think sometimes when we take a step out of that and we're willing to really deeply listen, like we can skip a lot of unnecessary steps, you know? And so a question as simple as, well, what should I do next with my career? has answered so many questions. You may not have the final answer. That sounds like you're kind of doing what you're supposed to be doing at this point. So I think you should be good there. But, you know, so many other questions were answered there. Mm-hmm. And something else is coming through. Is it okay if I share it with you? Yeah. You may already know, but I feel that you've had many, they're not really lifetimes, but um, some of them might involve incarnations, but you've you've had many energetic experiences around earth. It's like, what's the word? Like deva, energy, like around volcanoes, around the earth, around those energies. And, you know, you think about it, people have historically worshipped the volcano, right? And I've seen past lifetimes with people who were sacrificed into the volcano and understanding it very differently then we understand it with our minds because there were some people I've been, this is kind of going way off, but there I, I've seen this for clients. There's some people where, you know, they were really unwilling <laughs> and then there was some confusion involved, but there were others for whom it, it was just a surrendering. It was just a going home. It was just a beautiful, it wasn't creepy at all. It was mm-hmm. quite magical. And um, for some reason you need to have that information, but also for you, there's an energy around some of these natural sites. It's a metaphor. It's, I mean, it's a lot of things. And I I bet you you're feeling this right now. You know, you've been a part of that. And again, I don't think it's a body thing. If you're in a body, you're in a body briefly in service of that, but you've, you've been the caretaker of many a volcano. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And I feel that that resonates. So that's another reason why that feels you know, powerful to you. And many of us, you know, that have, I don't know if this applies to me, but it most definitely applies to you. There's many of us who are, you know, I don't always love the term light worker because it's so overused, but <laughs> soul workers. And, you know, those of us who are sort of, we're, we're caretakers of the earth. We're part of the earth's mission and purpose on many levels, not just the level of being a human incarnate. Mm. That's the truth of of you and who you are. You've been a caretaker and a participant in earth over many generations, mm. not always in human form. So the guys just wanted to give you that information. And I feel you've probably had it before and you're feeling it right now. So I just wanted to share that. <laughs> so much. Yes, I that rings so, so, so true. Yeah. And I've even noticed that there, I have a really strong relationship with place. And I think using that volcano as a symbol again that like I can feel what places will have that kind of generative impact on my life like I've known even since childhood that I'm originally from Pennsylvania but I've known since I was a kid like I will move to California because I need to like there's something about my soul growth that needs to happen against the backdrop of this setting in this land for who knows what reason but I've just always known that and even the countries that I've always felt a sense of a strong pull to, whether it's Hawaii, Iceland, I'm like realizing like, yeah, those are places of volcanic activity. So I definitely would love to visit them one day because it does feel like a soul home in a way that I did not realize. 
Right. And we use that. And, you know, there's a whole thing called astrocartography, right? Mm. We do have energetic alignments with aspects of the earth. And I imagine, too, it changes depending on what we need. And, you know, I'm someone who just swapped coasts. So, Mm. you know, and I understand exactly why I spent most of my adult life up until now on the East one. There was a lot of things to unravel there and to experience there. But boy, (laughs) I found my spiritual home, but quick here on the other coast. Mm. We've been talking a really long time and I'm sad because because I want to keep going. I have two more questions to ask you and then we, we got to wrap up. One question, because you talk a lot about doing your reading your records for yourself, mm-hmm. which is, I think, something that people don't usually think they can do. So I would love for you to briefly talk to people. You know, it's great to go to a reader. It's great to come to an intuitive. It's great to do all of those things. I love what I do. Please come to me. I'm really good at it. I'll make you happy. <laughs> but my real goal, right, is to empower my clients to get that information from themselves. And mm-hmm. I, I have support and I, I love, you know, getting my wisdom out of other people's mouths sometimes too, because it really does help. But the name of the game ultimately is to be able to get it for yourself. So can you talk to listeners about that a little bit? Sure. Um, So exactly what you're saying, I feel like in originally training to learn how to read the Akashic Records, one of my first teachers was Anna Sacy, but I actually learned from her online, so I never met her in person. Um, But a big part of her teaching was to learn how to read for others first. And so that's actually how I trained in the very beginning was learning how to give readings for other people and then realizing, I think we intentionally had to choose five strangers and do a reading for them. And then in for like delivering the reading and seeing that, oh my gosh, like I don't know this person, but I channel this information accurately. It builds your sense of trust in what you're tapping into. But I actually feel like it's made me feel not as skilled when it comes to reading for myself. And it's interesting the ways that reading for others and reading for yourself are similar, but also quite different. (laughs) Like it actually took me a bit of time to feel a sense of feeling skilled at reading for myself because of having trained reading for others first. And yeah, I think when it comes to reading the Akashic Records for yourself, it takes a particular kind of listening because I think sometimes it can be easy to get in your own way or wonder like, oh, am I just like thinking this thing or am I actually hearing the thing? Like it's like a fine tuned practice of learning how to trust what you're hearing and who you're hearing and discerning your more everyday voice from the voice of guidance. Whereas when I'm reading for other people, it's quite clear that like, I don't know anything about this person's life because I'm not someone who does an extensive intake where I'm like gathering this information. I actually go in quite blind intentionally. Then the record gives the information to me. But when it's yourself, you know these things. So yeah, there's an important discernment practice there. And then for myself, and probably once again in that volcanic nature, I feel like touching the records for myself in the beginning almost gave me like a touching the hot stove experience. (laughs) I unearthed a lot of trauma that looking back on, I'm so glad I needed it. And it came exactly when I needed it. But it was a process. Like I feel like every psychic tool is a relationship. And it took some time for me to feel that sense of solid ground and feel that sense of safety. But I don't say that to scare anyone. I think any experience that you have is the one that you need. But I definitely think it was a process of building that trust. And it was very different from the readings that I've done for others. I've never had an experience in reading for others where I was like, ah, that was scary. (laughs) But delving into your own depth, sometimes things emerge and you're just like, wow, I need to look at that. It was an important healing process, but it did take time. It's like any important relationship. Right. And you said something too, I think that, you know, that's sometimes the advantage of having someone with you too. You know, when Mm -hmm. we're delving into things that are really intense, sometimes it is nice to have someone on the outside. Yes. You know, that's holding the space for you that's not involved because, mm-hmm. again, sometimes you can't be that person for yourself. Exactly. That's so, 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 so true. Right. Having someone to help guide you through the experience or even just to be there to help anchor you through it as yeah. you're moving through the depths of who you are, it can be so helpful to have someone by your side as you do that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I asked this one last question to everyone on the show. How do you experience your intuition? And you've kind of already told us a little, but <laughs> you could just summarize. Yeah, I guess overall, this sounds kind of vague, but trusting my felt senses and particularly my dream work as well. I think really trusting what I hear, also trusting my body. If I'm doing like a quick decision, sometimes I'll like make 
moving my head to the left mean one option and moving my head to the right means another. And literally my body will answer before my mind does. <laughs> so sometimes it's very embodied of like my body will tell me what the answer is. But yeah, I think just trusting where I feel called and particularly even when it doesn't make sense, I feel like allowing life to not make sense. <laughs> yes, I think that is one of the biggest, biggest and greatest advice you can give to anyone in listening to your intuition is you have to allow life to sometimes not make sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah, like, I don't need a reason to feel guided towards X yeah. versus Y. Sometimes it just is. <laughs> yeah, and, and sometimes it makes sense later on. Usually it makes sense later on. But it's it's not about finding the sense, right? Because that's where we kind of derail ourselves back into our mind. Exactly. All right, my friend, this has been amazing. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe there's so much wisdom in such a young body. <laughs> if people want to work with you, find you, follow you. I know you have a blog. I know that you give readings. Can you tell us where they can do that? And we'll have this information in the show notes too. Sure. Um, so the best place to reach me would be my website. So it's MelanieHorton.com. Um, so M-E-L-A-N-I-E-H-O-R-T-O-N.com. Beautiful. All right. I love it. Thank you. This has been amazing. And thank you to the listeners who suggested this beautiful conversation. And for all of you guys tuning in because of you, I get to do this, which I love and which I am so grateful. So thank you again all for tuning in and namaste. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that you found joy, strength, inspiration, and clarity from today's episode. If you'd like to learn more and connect with an amazing group of like-minded souls, please join us over on Facebook in the Intuitive Connection Community Facebook group, where we explore these topics in deeper detail, have additional live teachings, and host Facebook Lives with our amazing guests. I hope to see you there. And of course, if you want to learn more about me or the work that I do, please check out my webpage, victoriashawintuitive.com. Thank you so much again and namaste.